Hey, let's stand. I'm going to read a few passages of scripture from the book of John, verse 7. I think we have it on the slides. You can put that on the screen. Verse 7, 6, uh, six through 8. This is Jesus speaking to his brothers. It says, therefore, Jesus told them, my time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I'm not going up to the festival because my time has not yet fully come. It's the word of the Lord. Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you will meet us here in this time. Lord, we ask that your time, your timing will break into our time. Lord, that you will wake us up to God's time tonight. Lord, that this time will be holy time, sanctified time. Lord, that in the next hour, we ask that eternity will break into the hour on earth. That somehow, Lord, you will pour out your spirit in such a way that you will accomplish exceedingly more than what we think is possible In an hour, Lord, because your timing breaks into our time. Lord, as we open your word, we open our hearts and we say, speak, God. Speak. We're listening. We're hungry. We're leaning. Just say, feed me the bread of heaven tonight, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So uh, we're, we're in City of God. Are you learning something? You know, good questions to ask yourself every time you, you leave the house of God. What did you love? What did you learn? We should be learners. We're coming here to learn, to be fed. We're not coming here going through the motions. We're coming here with fresh eyes because the Spirit of God's doing a new thing, teaching us something we don't know. Right? He's, he's, he's so big. It's funny sometimes we drift into this routinized familiarity with the house of God. We're like, we're coming to camp around God. We don't quite know what's going to happen. Our knees should knock a little bit, yes? Come on. Well, city of God, and, and we, uh, we've, we've had a number of preachers. How about Riley's word last week? Were you stirred? I saw the veins popping from his neck. I'm like, oh, wow, there's some passion in there. All right, uh, and, and we're going to continue to have a number of voices, uh, uh, even some marketplace voices in the midst of this series, which I think is so fitting because we're talking about God's intention that he wants to redeem cities. Scripture started in a garden. It ends in a city. It's this narrative frame that helps us understand the scripture that he put us in Eden. He gave us this priestly vocation. Priests are those who behold and imitate God. They have the gift of access. Say access. We get to be with God. Do you you realize the privilege of nights like this? That we get to gather openly and freely in the name of Jesus and experience, like, I mean, that spirit of praise, my goodness, my heart was shaking inside of me. We get the gift of access and then we have the gift of authority. Say authority. We've been given authority as sons and daughters of God to actually express governing leadership to the earth. The earth is our domain. He gave it to us. Some of you are like, whoa, really? Yeah, read Genesis. It's like, till it, keep it, steward it, govern the earth. So we have access, we have authority. Our job is to use this gift of access and authority to minister to the Lord to minister to one another and build communities, to build families. We see Adam doing this in the garden. He walks with God in the cool of the day. He cultivates a community. He then is told to steward his vocation to minister to the world. He has a job, say job. God cares a lot about your job. That's not the unspiritual part of your life. That doesn't matter. It matters a lot to him. The fact that he would have you spend 40 plus hours a week doing it means it cares a lot to him because you're an eternal being made in the image of God with the ability to do creative capacity, right? So through ministering to the Lord, through one another and creating community, through ministering to the world, we are actually meant to expand the borders of this garden so that the garden becomes the end of the story. It's what? 
a city, right? God is not just after church gatherings. He's after cities. And we see the picture of the consummated kingdom in Revelation 21, 22. I'm talking fast because this is a last message. So if you weren't here, get on the podcast. You can zip right up. But the consummated kingdom is an entire city, a whole city, a city of righteousness, a city of the presence of the Lord, a city that is meant to be seen as the Holy of Holies, that the Holy of Holies was never meant to just be contained in a little box on a hill in Jerusalem. The whole earth is meant to become a Holy of Holies. Whew, come on. The whole earth is meant to become a Holy of Holies. Right? If we really get this and this sinks past just like a good, good word pastor and into our hearts, you start to realize that there is no scarcity of powerful anointings, callings, like purpose in the earth. Too many people in the church are walking around with a sense of, I don't know my purpose, I don't know my significance. It's because we haven't seen the full thing. God is not just consumed with just the house of God. The house of God is meant to go viral. The whole earth is meant to become a house of God. Woo. Right, so, so in this, we talked about um, that, 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 that part of this, and this is a redeemed vocation. This was forfeited through sin, redeemed through Christ. He recommissions us. He gives us great commandment, great commission that we would love the Lord and that we would one another and then that we would go and baptize all nations and disciple them making in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, that we would turn the whole world into a Trinitarian reality. That kind of sounds like heaven, So uh, in this, uh, the, 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 um, the, there's, there's the, the mandate of worship, say worship, worship. Right? cultivating a life of presence, a life, um, you know, the, the worship, worship is an old English word, it just means worship, it's, it's to actually so value God um, to put such value, honor, right? This, we do this through our time, through our affections, through our money, through our lives, that we would so value him that we then try to be like him. Say, be like him. This is what you do. You try to be like people that you, you value. You know how they say flattery is the greatest compliment? You know, it's because you're, that, that's part of this be like thing in us. So we are so, we, we give such value to Jesus that our whole lives become worship because we're like, I am so amazed by who you are. I, I make, I'm, I'm living into my priestly call of access to bring the offering of myself to cultivate true unity and intimacy with Jesus so that then I just try to be like him. Right, so worship, it's worshipful. We have to learn to be the kind of worshipers that the Father's looking for. Right, but it's, it's worship. This is uh, the picture we get of Sabbath. It's this endless enjoyment of the presence of God. Right, that, that God made the earth, put man in it, and then he moved in so that we could be with him. He loves that. Right, so it's worship is part of this vocation. Um, but then there's also warfare. Say Warfare. Talked about cosmic conflict, um, this, this idea that before Genesis 1, there was a war in the heavens, and we see this war manifesting all throughout Scripture, this spiritual war. That's what cosmic means. It's just, just a theological term speaking to like the reality of a spiritual war. We see in Egypt that it's not just between Israel and Pharaoh. It is between Yahweh and the gods of Egypt. Right? You, you see they get into Canaan. It's not just that there's a spiritual conflict. You see it most explicitly in the Gospel of John. There is a cosmic conflict. There is a, an, a spiritual adversary. There is the reality of evil. And so um, it's worship, but it's also warfare. Right? So the journey of going from garden to city means warfare. The journey of you fulfilling your role to create a thin space in your life is going to be warfare. Yeah? So worship, warfare, and then work. Say work, somebody. Work. Woo! It's work. It's going to require perseverance. Like work, right? It's one plus six equals seven. That's the scriptural pattern. Sabbath day rest, the worship of God on the Sabbath is meant to turn the other six days into worshipful work where you're co-laboring with Christ in his mission to redeem the creation that he loves. 
He has no intention to abandon creation. He wants to redeem creation. Creation will be judged. It will be baptized with fire, you could be said, just like Jesus experienced the judgment, the baptism of death, but it was resurrected into a new thing. Jesus is the same body, new body, same earth, new earth. Jesus isn't abandoning the earth. The end of the story is not the church whisked away to heaven. The end of the story is heaven coming to earth and, and we're, we're together. Okay, that's a lot of theology. Are you here? Are you still alive? Right, so, so from that, we, we took this worship, warfare, work, and we talked about thin spaces. Looked at somebody and said, you're a thin space. Say, so your face is a thin space. It is. Your, space, your face is a literal thin place. Your face puts a face on your inner world. If you stare long enough into someone's face, you'll start to see what's going on on the inside of their hearts. I love watching it. Who's blessed by this choir up here? These, these choir, like, they, like giving themselves. You know, if you just, sometimes I look and I'll just see their faces and it will move my heart. Because the, out of the, the overflowing of their heart, it's being expressed through face. It's the beauty of face-to-face uh, relationship. This is uh, why God wants to show us his face. Yeah, so um, thin space. Talk about thin space, that, that if we want to talk about redeeming creation, so redeeming a city, this is where we get practical. You're like, this is a great a bunch of good theology. Turn a garden into a city. Then you go home, you're like, okay, what am I going to eat tonight? And <laughs> what time's work in the morning, right? Like, how do we get this practical? How does this become, like, earthy, right? So we talked about if we're, if we're looking at creation, like, what we're doing, our lives, is we're in uh, time and space, Yeah? So we talked about space. We're going to talk about time, but just to recap, space, thin space, that, that, that the spaces, there's physical spaces in our lives. So like our home would be a good starting place. Actually, I would say our own, our own hearts are a good starting place. You know, that we would cultivate a thin space, a tabernacle, um, tabernacling presence of the Lord so that we become a thin space. You know, the greatest compliment I ever get is from people who don't know me in random places describe to me how they experience the presence of God when I get close to them. I've had this a handful of times. I wish I could say it was every day, but it's the greatest compliment because I'm like, this is amazing. I'm actually stewarding the presence of the Lord. I am a thin space where heaven and earth, the veil is so thin that heaven and earth are intermingled in me. Right? So, so if you want to become a thin space, it starts with you. But the amazing thing is the, the John 7 river says, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of life. Meaning that the way that I steward and I become worshipful, like, like this is how I think of thin space. The more you pray somewhere, the more you'll pray there. This is what I mean. There are places where if you pray there habitually, every time you go there, you'll be more prone to pray there than not. Right? There's also places that uh, you're, you're, you'll be not prone to, to pray. Like places that are full of distraction and noise, you're not going to be prone to pray. I bet you very few people sitting in this room, you're prone to pray wherever a desk with a computer is. Like, I'm just going to offer that because that's not a thin place. That's not a space where you have communed with God. Because what happens is we actually can redeem physical space through, through offering praise and worship. I talked about how I was in Ireland and there's mountains. They're like, those are thin spaces. The, the Celtic tradition really zeroes in on this. I just talked to some people in our church. There's a thin space just outside of Scottsdale, Arizona, where these sisters um, pray, these really simple, humble sisters pray. And it's this little prayer garden. What's it called? He's the one who told me about it. He can't remember what it's called. Anyways, it doesn't matter. But people, I've heard like two, multiple people in our congregation, they're like, I've gone there and it is so holy is the holiest place because that space has been sanctified, right? That space has been filled with God, as it were, right? And so we coming to church, this is a thin space. How many of you would say you experience God in a way here in this building on Sunday nights that's unique, right? So what you don't realize is you're actually being discipled into something that now the point is not, wow, let me create a whole theology that my life, I need to come to Riverhouse on Sunday nights because God's gonna be there in a unique way. No, that may be true, but the point is you're coming here to be discipled so that now you can go and be commissioned to create a thin space where you live and do your life. Right? right, right. right? Like, we want to have reputations that our homes are the thin spaces in our neighborhood. 
right? That there, there, there be spaces within our home that like, like right now I'm kind of on a systematic, a systematic crusade. There's places in my house where I'm like, I want this to be a thin space. I want that couch to be a thin space. I want my outdoor patio to be a thin space. I want my bedroom and my bed to be a thin space. I want my shower to be a thin space. Don't think too hard about that. I want my, like seriously, I want Naomi's rocking chair to be a thin space because this is the piece of dirt that God's asked me to steward, literally. My house. And I have authority as a child of God to cultivate a thin space. And the way I'm going to do this, there's three P's you can put on. It's presence, say presence, perseverance, say perseverance, and practice, right? So presence, the more you pray somewhere, the more you'll pray there. Some of you are like, I do not like sitting at my office at work. Pray there. Get 20 minutes, get to your cubicle 20 minutes earlier and start praying there. Start seeing what happens. Because your relationship with God will overflow into creation itself. This is amazing. I, I know a guy who was telling me how he started practicing this. And one time he's driving, uh, he's driving and he's sitting in the uh, gas station in the parking lot. And a guy pulls up and he could feel the darkness in this car. And he just starts saying, Lord, I'm a thin space. Like I release your presence. Let your presence overflow. The guy literally starts having an encounter with God, turns off his music, he's crying. And it like leads into this evangelistic encounter because he literally just started praying. Right, so how much more, right? So presence is the first part of thin space, right? Because again, we're talking about redeeming cities. Are you guys at church 40 hours a week? Are you guys at church 40 hours a week? Where are you 40 hours a week? At work. And are there believers or unbelievers mostly next to you? What? Unbelievers, do you see the potential? You're like, I don't know how to preach the gospel because everyone's Christianized out in American culture. They might not want to preach the gospel yet, but they do want the presence of God. Everyone is longing for heaven and earth to come together. You becoming a thin space, whoo, right? So presence, but then perseverance. Say perseverance, right? Perseverance is, is this is the warfare piece. You gotta, you got, you're gonna have to fight. I, I, C.S. Lewis says, Every square inch of the universe is contested. It is first claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Right? So we have to wake up and recognize there is evil and there are spiritual forces of wickedness that are at play. And you're, you're not just casually going into like, oh, let's make this a cool thin space. No, you're, it's warfare. This is Joshua. Every place you put your foot I'm with you. This is you taking your authority as a child of God. Jesus says, all authority has been given to you. Say given. given. Past, present, future. Past, present, future. Past. No, it's not present. It's not future. All authority has been given to you. That's the great commission. You have authority, meaning you just step in there and you say, I take this space in the name of Jesus. I release uh, the kingdom of God. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I bind every demonic force. I bind every spiritual force of wickedness in the heavenly places. The battle is not flesh and blood. You might be frustrated with your boss, but you're not frustrated with your boss because it's not flesh and blood. You're, I'm here to be a servant. I'm here with a towel. I'm unoffendable because the enemy wants to get me offended so that I'm completely powerless to bring any transformation to this environment. So I will bless when I'm cursed. I will wash feet when I know they're stabbing me on the back. I, I will be Christ to this place because I'm here in a war right now. And some of you are going to find, like, you're going to try to step in and all hell's going to break loose. That's when you should get really excited. Because when the, when the, the enemy starts going, ah, it's because he's scared. And you're going to break through that. Right? I, I started claiming some spaces in my home. All of a sudden, the crazy dreams start happening at night. I'm like, oh, let's go. <laughs> oh, I'm like, let's go. And now I've had dreams. I've had multiple dreams with, I'll just like, like, they're usually like animals, like scary animals, but they stand at the border of my property. There's a berm just behind it. I'm like, it's because they can't come here. <laughs> this is my space. Some of you are like, oh, don't say that because then the devil might get you. No, no, no. <laughs> He who lives in me 
is greater than he who lives in the world. We're not on the defense being like, oh, you know, let's, let's, let's be good, but not be too. Like, no, no, no. We're on the offense. He's on his heels. It's time to kick him in the mouth and put him back where he belongs. All authority, the name above every name and all authority given to Christ, who is the head of the church, so that every enemy, it's Ephesians 1, I'm blanking it, but it's under his feet. Say feet. That was a freestyle. It's under his feet. And who's his body? The church. Meaning, it's Paul just trying to say, the lowest member of the body of Christ is over every enemy. Okay, so perseverance, say perseverance. All right, and then practice. Say practice. This is the power of habits. Right? When you do things habitually, it becomes automatic. When you pray in the same place all the time, you'll pray there all the time. When, when you... When you Make it a point to, like that little habits of life, right? Dallas Willard says that grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Right? We, we can't be afraid of work, effort, labor. It's going to take effort to again and again show up because the battle is going to be real. And you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be on the offense and guess what? A, 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 you're going to take a few punches in the mouth. What are you going to do then? You're just going to keep on keeping on. Long obedience in the same direction because I either believe the word of God or I don't. And this is my ground. This is my space. So I just want to tell you, it doesn't matter if you're the business owner or if you're the janitor and the lowest of the low of the org chart. You have authority because you're not defined as a Christian by the outer titles that the Babylon and the empires of this world put on us. We are defined by the inward revelation that I am a child of God and have been given how much authority? All authority. So wherever I go in the name of Jesus, all the authority of Jesus manifests through me. And I'm a game changer. I'm going to turn things around. I'm a thin place. I'm preaching right now. This is the warm up. All right, so thin space. Yeah? All right, let's, let's jump into time because uh, we do live life in space, but it also takes place in time. Come on, somebody. Right, so I, I want to just kind of share some things. Um, first, there's this little book. It's called Domestic Monastery, Creating a Spiritual Life at Home. Anybody who is married or have kids, you should get this book. Super tiny, like teeny tiny, like 50 pages, big words. You could read this in like less than an hour, literally. But it is packed full of wisdom. I'm going to share a couple things tonight, but I think it's worth reading um, if you find yourself in the rhythm of an everyday, ordinary, domestic life. Um, it's such a beautiful perspective. Um, it's written by a guy named Ronald Rollheiser. He's a Franciscan monk. And he is um, writing in this book to show how the domestic life and parent, parenting and all the stuff that we think is so ordinary is actually uh, can be a monastery of its own if you have eyes to see and recognize, right? And it's built, he, he tells the story of a, a guy named Carlo Corretto. He is an Italian uh, like monk and he went um, and spent 12 years in the Sahara Desert in solitude in prayer. He fasted. He lived off a, a daily diet of a small piece of cheese from a goat that he would get the milk and make cheese. That's what he lived on. And then he spent his uh, free, free time um, interpreting scripture, uh, translating it to a local Bedouin language. Sounds, um, anybody else want to join Carla? <laughs> So I'm going to give a call for everyone, whoever wants to move the mountain home with me. I'm, I'm, I'm joking, right? So, so this guy, uh, Carlo, spends 12 years um, in this type of um, uh, secluded monastic lifestyle. He returns back home to Italy after 12 years. He spends time with his mother, and he comes to the conclusion that his mother is both more contemplative and less selfish than he is. And he doesn't make the conclusion that he was wrong to go and do what God had asked him to do, but he makes the conclusion that it was very right for his mother to do what God had asked his mother to do. And the premise of the book is trying to, un, to, to break us out of this um, aesthetical, unapproachable spirituality and recognize that, that the gospel is right here in, in front of our eyes. Um, and one of the things that I, I really love, this is just a, this is a little thing um, that, that's going to, I'm going to jump in and then build on time here is 
that the, the monks, the monastic life, if you were to um, go and join a monastery, which there's, there's monasteries around Boise. Um, one time I played a, a prank on someone. He's, I won't say who, but it was an elder in our church, and I hacked his Facebook, and I told a joke that he was moving to the monastery up, and that's like three hours away, and joining this monastic order, and he, he was running into people for a year afterwards, being like, I thought you moved up to the to the monastery. So I, I, I've matured since then, so I don't do that anymore. Um, but anyway, so this is real. These, these are real men and women, monks and nuns, that are living really beautiful lives devoted to prayer. One of the things that they, are, um, they come under is the monastic bell. So there's this little bell, uh, well sometimes it's a big bell, and they ring this bell throughout the day. So um, like some of the orders, monastic orders, like you can read where they literally are so severe that they say, if you hear that bell and you are writing a letter, stop mid-letter. Don't even finish, don't dot the I, don't cross the T, because they are training them to remember that you are not living on your time, you are on God's time. So they live to this bell, and when that bell rings, they go and pray, and when it rings, they go and work, and when it rings, they go and eat, and they've been trained. They're being sanctified that life's not about you. Life is about God, and time doesn't belong to you. Time belongs to God, and that you aren't the one who gets to control how you spend your time. God is the one who gets to decide how you spend your time. And whoa, I can feel the tension in the room. You're like, uh-oh, this is gonna turn to me at some point. I know it, and this is uncomfortable, right? It's true, uh, but, but Rollheiser makes this beautiful point. He says, you know, um, this could sound severe and super aesthetic. He's like, but if you talk to a mother of a nursing baby, it's not. Because she has a bell too. The only difference is she doesn't know when the bell's gonna go off. And she doesn't know what kind of bell it's gonna be. It might be a poopy bell, it might be a crying bell, it might be a, a little tyrant bell. We're having two year old bells all the time now. You know what I mean? Like there's a bell, and that bell's ringing, and that bell's going off at times you don't know. And every time it rings, if you have ears to hear, it's God summoning you. Right. Time's not your own. Right. Wow. Isn't, that, isn't that beautiful? You know, monasteries, he says, a monastery is not a place for monks and nuns. It's a place that's set apart, period. That's what a monastery is. You know, monasteries are secluded places at the margins of society that draw monks and nuns away from the centers of attention, prestige, and power. And in any, you know, stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad or really any parents of, of younger children, you know, you know this. Uh, you know the same reality. You're at home, you're hidden in the margin, away from achievement, power, wealth, prestige, what so much of our culture says is success. And this parenthood is a monastery if you choose to see it. Right, the, the point I'm trying to make in all of this is that God is wanting us to wake up to the same reality that we are in a monastery of life. Like, like we're, we're called and he is intentionally brooding over our lives and he is the one who's setting our schedules. He is the one who's creating our agendas if we have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that wants to lean in and obey it. Right? And this is not the message of culture. The message of culture is I'm free to do what I want any old time, right? And then they're like, yeah, who the sun sets free is free indeed to do whatever I want. Any old time, it's like, sing that worship song again, whatever I want. <laughs> then all of a sudden they have existential crisis when Jesus comes as Lord, and he's like, no, <laughs> yes. And it's like, you're a monster. <laughs> Those are nervous laughs. This is so much of Western gospel. I'm like giving you a parody right now. On Western Christianity. God help me. All right, so, so John 7. I read this, this passage at the beginning. We stood. Jesus is having this really interesting conversation with his brothers about time. They're coming up to him. They're mocking him, actually. They're, they're kind of defaming him. They're like, hey, anybody that wants to be famous needs to go to Jerusalem. Why are you doing all your stuff in Galilee? Go up to Jerusalem where all the big wigs are and strut your stuff up there if you're trying to be somebody. This is the context, super fun conversation. Anybody with brothers in the room, you've had a few of these over the years, right? The difference is that your brother wasn't Lord. So, so, so Jesus responds to this and he says them, he says, you know, my time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. 
Uh, the world can't hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I'm not going up to the festival because my time has not yet fully come. It's an interesting passage. I want to unpack it a bit, and then, and then we'll get right back into this practical stream. That's because the interesting thing is that, like a few verses later, Jesus does indeed go up to the festival. So you have to kind of ask yourself, what's he saying here? Right? And one of the things, particularly in John's gospel, there's three words in the Greek that are used for time. The first one is aura. Say aura. This is explicitly used when Jesus is speaking of the hour of the cross. He says, my time has not come, my time has not come. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying the second Greek word for time we see, which is kairos. Say kairos. And in this situation, he's actually saying, he's saying, my kairos, saying God's appointed time for me to go up to Jerusalem, it's not here yet. And he's actually kind of given like a backhanded slap to his brothers, and he's giving a scathing critique because he says, but your chronos, your time is any time you want. Right? So what he's actually telling them is, I'm living under the sovereignty of God's timeline. I'm actually living. He's the one setting my agenda, creating my moments. He's the one who's governing my calendar. He's not governing yours. So you can do whatever you want. And he's basically telling them, you're of the world. And the world doesn't like me. <laughs> this is like super intense when you see it. You're like, oh, wow, super fun, right? Because this is a Hebrew context. They all know Ecclesiastes says there's a time for everything. A time to build, a time to tear down, a time to reap, a time to sow. It's this idea that God's timing, he's governing for the individual, for communities, you know, local churches, for the people of Israel. He, he had timing, and Jesus is saying, I'm living into God's time, you're not. Whew. Who wants to live on God's time? I want to live into Kairos, right? Jesus is living into Kairos. He's not doing things just to do things. He's hearing that bell. He knows what time it is. And he doesn't just know what time it is, he's living into that time, right? Because, yes, we want to cultivate thin space, but we want to live in holy time. We want our calendar to be God's calendar. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to woo you into wanting this more by the end of these next uh, 15 minutes, right? Because this is, this is such good news. And so I have three A's for you. This is going to help us. I'm just on an alliteration kick tonight. Um, but aim, awareness, and action, Right, so I'm going to talk about setting our aim, creating awareness that leads to action so that we can wake up to what time it is so we can start hearing that bell and following it. Good. Good. Quiet in the room. All right, aim. I have found that the, the, Romans 8, 29, it says um, those who he predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. Right, that, 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 that God has an aim for you and me. And I found that once our aim aligns with his aim, life has a way of coming into alignment that it couldn't have before. Right? Life has a way of coming into focus when we recognize that God's primary intention is to form Christ Jesus in you. This will alleviate so much confusion and heartache. You will not be as disillusioned as you could be if you recognize that God's aim, his trophy, is that he would form Christ Jesus in you. That you would become a cruciformed one. The shape and the love and the character and the nature of the cross would so transform you that it would lead you out of death and into resurrection. It will lead you into death and then out of it into resurrection. Right? God is fascinated with Jesus and he has sent the spirit to form Christ Jesus in you so that you will look like him like this is what God is after this is his aim this is where the crosshairs of his bullseye cross your life this is what he's giving you time for he's like I'm forming Christ in you all right uh when I when I was uh, much, much younger much more uh immature, immature uh I I was just yeah, I was a knucklehead, right? It was like a decade ago. But I, I, I came into ministry and had all these ideals of what ministry was. I had all these notions and these grandiose thoughts and, and prophetic words, mind you. Um, and, and I found that uh, as I began in ministry, I hated it. Just hated it. It was so, I thought it was such a waste of time. 
because I was uh, in a back room of a church. I had five people coming. It was, I, I did not like my circumstances and I didn't agree with them. And I was super frustrated because I felt like my time was being wasted. I could do so many things that would be so much more productive and fruitful and worthy of uh, recognition. And I got depressed, I got angry, I got frustrated. I had dynamics that were painful. I, I, like, I was convinced this was a big, fat waste of time. And so I did what every spiritual man of God, young man of God does. I started sending emails trying to find an escape route because I was convinced I had taken a, a, take a wrong turn and I needed to change my circumstances. Literally, I was trying to get out of it. And the Lord, uh, he confronted me one day. He said, yeah, you can, you can go. He's like, but your baggage flies with you. <laughs> I was like, what? He said, you can leave this. You can leave these circumstances, he said, but I've spent a few years to get you into these. I was like, what? It's like, these suck. I don't like these. I don't, I don't like these circumstances. I want to get out of these. And God said, Jordan, I'll never forget this moment. I remember where I was. I remember what time it was. I remember. And he said, what is your joy in life? And I just kind of sat there and I was like, Tell me more. Is this a rhetorical question? Like, you're getting at something, right? And he said, is your joy becoming like Jesus? And I sat and I thought about it. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and I started realizing, I realized the depth of that question. I said, yeah, it is. That, that should be my joy. That should be my aim. That should be my mission. And he said, well, you have a decision to make. He said, I've worked quite diligently to get you into these circumstances. He said, and I'm using these circumstances to form Jesus in you. He said, I'm using these circumstances to break your independent spirit. And I'm using these circumstances to disciple you into true patience that will endure for a long race. And he said, and so you have a decision. Are you going to submit to my formation in your life? Or are you going to try to escape it and find some other circumstance where the things, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get better. And I tell you what, I, I saw the wisdom of the Lord and my heart leapt and I submitted to it. It was a profound moment in my life where I said, yes, I, I heard the bell of God calling to me and I submitted to it. And I walked that process. And that was a precedental season in my life that I can say has continued for the last decade plus um, as I've continued in the years of ministry because life is a journey about becoming. The doing serves the becoming. I remember I was in university so upset because I, I wasn't doing very much. Um, I wanted, I was, you know, you're just learning and nobody listens to you and you like feel like you can conquer the world and you can because Christ lives inside of you. There's no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit, right? And I had this anointing on me and I wanted, I, I couldn't wait. I was like the horse in that stall, you know, before the race. I'm like, put that thing down, put that thing down. And I remember uh, like a, a wiser mentor in my life was like, God cares more about who you're becoming than what you're doing. And I was like, okay, you're right. Four years. Yes, I'll care about, it's about who I'm becoming. About, you know, and then it goes down and you start running. And you start realizing that if life becomes about the doing, it just starts getting really empty all over again. Because it doesn't like end. Life is about becoming. And the doing serves the becoming. The becoming doesn't serve the doing. You don't, you don't give yourself and submit and say, form Christ in me so that then I can go and blah, blah, blah. It's everything that he gives us to do. It's the timing of the Lord. It's the season of the Lord. It's the assignment of the Lord. And that bell is ringing. He's saying, are you going to let me set your time and submit to it and live and give yourself wholeheartedly to it as for the Lord and not for man? Knowing that your reward comes from him, it doesn't come from man. Your praise comes from God, it doesn't come from man. Man looks at outer appearance. Man looks at accolade. Man looks at achievement. Man looks at prestige and privilege and pleasure and all these things. But God looks at the heart. And what God wants to see is, are you a heart that loves my wisdom, that has the fear of the Lord, and submits to the grace that I'm giving you in every season of your life? Woo! You're going to have to listen to this one again, right? So, so as my aim came into line, all of a sudden, awareness began to blossom. And I began to become aware of what? The cross. 
the very thing that I was complaining about, I now started recognizing this is the cross sent to crucify my flesh and lead me into the resurrection of, transfer, of a transformed life. The, the same, I, I had this very challenging relational dynamic in this season of my life that I literally used to dread seeing this person because it was so painful. And the Lord said, that is the primary thing I'm using to form patience in you. I was like, oh my God, no. And I started, this was the shift. All of a sudden I started getting joyful. I was like, this is God's grace to me. And I literally, every time I would meet or see or pass, I'd be like, thank you, God, that you are forming Christ in me. I thank you. I bless this time together. I bless this, this interaction. I bless this conversation. I open my heart. Teach me how to bless when I feel wronged. Teach me how to be kind when I feel criticized. Teach me how to have a patient, forbearing heart that would bear with the weakness of another who is blind and doesn't see that they're even causing pain. You know, like it was a perspective shift. Because when our aim gets alignment, all of a sudden awareness starts, we start, we start becoming aware of what we were blind to before. We start to see the cross, that the cross is woven into God's time because he is dead set to form Christ in you. So he's setting your calendars, he's creating. You know, sometimes it's like I get frustrated still because I'm like, God, there's always such extremes in my life. There's always places in my life that are like resurrection glory, and I'm like, I just want to stay here. I want to build a tabernacle around it. I don't want to leave. Just let me stay right here in resurrection. But then I got to go home and it's like, gosh, I got to pay the bills and I'm stressed. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I just got to get back. God's like, God, I just got to like, give me get back to resurrection. You know, I realize it's like, it's like there's such extremes. You know, you like see a healing breakthrough and then you're dead sick in bed two days later. You're like, what the heck is happening? We'll never get rid of the cross. We will carry the death and the resurrection of Jesus throughout this life. It's part of the now and not yet season. We're not going to escape the not yet. The cross is our greatest joy. But when we start to come under God's wisdom, God's wisdom has a way of it's different than the wisdom of the world. God's wisdom has a way that we start looking at the cross. We're like, that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And you start to actually run to and cling the cross in your life. Right? The places that you used to repel because you're like, no, this is ugly. I don't like this relationship. I don't want to be next to that person. I don't want to be at this church. This church is not right. I need to, like, we, we want to get as far away. We want a healthy distance from the cross. We're like, I'll look at it here. But cling to this thing? Cling to this? No, that that's the wisdom. When our aim comes into alignment, boom, awareness opens. We see the cross and it's like, oh, like, thank you. Like, thank you. Like, let this thing go deeper in me. Right? And what happens is when we recognize the invitation, the cross that calls to us day after day, this is, this is our schedule planner. This is our personal assistant setting up divine appointments all throughout our day. And now we get to glory and resurrection when it comes, but we get to rejoice in the midst of trial and say, thank you for the cross. Form, do your work in me. Because God's aim is to make us like, Je like Jesus. You know, I, I'm a, I like my quiet time. I wake up early most days, and my daughter just loves the morning for some reason. And I got frustrated. I just get frustrated. I started getting so frustrated. Like, God, it, there was a season where it was, like, it was like she was competing with me. If I woke up 20 minutes earlier, she woke up 20 minutes earlier. It was like, what the heck? Every time I sit down, I got my coffee, and I'm like, oh, yes. And it's like, wah, and I'm like, oh, God. But this is what the Lord's been telling me. So when you hear her, he said, it's time. Wow. Yeah. You know, he's been asking me for these little disciplines in my life, and he said, it doesn't matter what you feel like. It's time. I'll just hear him. It's time. I don't feel like exercise. It's time. I don't feel like working on It's time. I don't feel like doing the dishes right now. It's time. My wife's like, amen. <laughs> it's time. It's time. I, I, I'm, I'm having to mature. Like, I'll just confess openly. I am having to mature that time's not my own. And parenthood is forcing that maturity. 
slash my wife. I'm joking. <laughs> she is so gracious to me, you guys. You have no idea. You think I'm all spiritual. I get home and I'm not. And she loves me. Okay, so awareness leads to action. Say action. It's not enough to know what time it is. You have to act on it. Matthew 21, I think we have it on the screen. This is a parable of the two sons. Jesus says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today. Say work. Work. Jesus is saying that to some of you. Go and work. Go and work in the vineyard. Oh, is this workspace right? No. This is not workspace righteousness. You don't earn righteousness, but you do obey Jesus as Lord. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he didn't go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. This is the Pharisees. Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness. You didn't believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you didn't repent and believe him. I find it interesting that Jesus says you didn't repent and believe him. We think of faith like this is this private decision I make in my heart. Jesus is saying, no, I see your faith by what you do. Like repentance looks like something. Belief looks like something. You want more? Say don't build above a biblical theology from one verse. Turn right to the book of James, chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom not to do whatever you want any old time, the freedom to follow Christ completely and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. The Bible has a word. I love you, but I'm going to say this. The Bible has a word for people who hear the word of life, who discern what time it is and do nothing about it. A fool. That's the book of Proverbs in a nutshell. All right, so we have to tap into the power of The human will. Now, I want to say this explicitly. The will is not the leader of our lives. The Holy Spirit is. We we should not be led by the will. We should not be led by our discipline. That's not good. The will is actually a really good follower of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit dings the bell and says, this is what time it is, our will has the ability to set our face and say, I will do this thing. You see this with Jesus? It says uh, he, there, was, there was a trigger that when he heard about Lazarus, it was the first time he said, my time, my aura, the time of the cross has come. And I believe Matthew or Luke's gospel, it says that he set his face like flint toward Jerusalem. When the Holy Spirit dinged the bell and said, it's time, your time for the cross has come. It says Jesus channeled his will. He set his face like flint. Nothing was going to keep him from Jerusalem. And did things try to? Yes, his own disciples. You don't need to do that. You don't need to go to the cross. Get behind me, Satan. I'm doing what the Spirit has instructed me to do because my life's not my own. I'm living to give myself as a ransom for many. He keeps going. Then he gets to the Gethsemane. His own will is vacillating because of his own fear and insecurity and the fear of the pain of the cross and the pain of the sin and the darkness. And he's saying, it's not my will. He's saying, my will's weak, but your will be done. And the Holy Spirit sends angels and ministers to him. And even then his will says, no, I'm going to do whatever you want, whatever you ask. That's the power of a sanctified will. And our will helps us follow the Holy Spirit so that we can act on what the Spirit reveals I honestly think that that obedience to what we often perceive as very small um, ask of the Holy Spirit have some of the most profound consequences in our life. Right? God, whenever he asks for something, he's setting our calendar. He's saying, I'm inviting you into my time. Do you know how many times in my life one little act of obedience that didn't make sense positioned here that this that didn't is a domino and it'll be two years later and I'll see all of this stuff happening and I follow the domino back and I'm like it was that little act of obedience gotta act yeah 
All right, I'm going to close. I know it's time. Uh, maybe just, just have them hold the kids for five minutes, and then we'll be done. All right, I want to just give you, the, this is the benefits of living on holy time. John 15 says, all fruitfulness flows from intimacy with Jesus. Yeah, all fruitfulness flows from intimacy with Jesus, right? And there is always enough time for intimacy. But this is what I want to tell you. Intimacy isn't a time stamp. It's not, I had 60 minutes and therefore I was intimate. Intimacy is about connection. There is time for connection with Jesus. It's going to look different in different seasons, but the aim is not a time stamp. The aim is the connection of the heart. And this is what I want to say to you. Like Martin Luther, right? He was leading the Reformation. And he, he, this is his quote. He said, I have so much to do today that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Right? There, there is a strange wisdom to the way, what happens when we live into God's time. When we start obeying, when we prioritize ministry of the Lord and intimacy with Jesus. When we start obeying the Holy Spirit when it doesn't make sense. Somehow he impregnates the rest of the time in a way that we can't quite understand. Here, bring me the, I, I have a prop tonight. I've gotten real creative. I, I, I don't know if you've seen this before, but I, I see this. Is, this is something that I have seen to be experientially true in my life. All right? You're like, here's my time. I only got so much time. I got all these big things to do my time. I've got, you know, uh, 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 you know the big things I'd say are the God things. Well, I, I want to be an intimate lover of Jesus. I'm a worshiper, right? That's our first identity, by the way. Lover, beloved child. Beloved bride, worshiper. Like, and, you know, and, and, and so we're like, okay, well, I, I, I gotta be intimate with Jesus, but then I've got, I'm a mom, and I'm a wife, and I'm a dad, and I'm a, I'm a husband, and then I've gotta take care of myself, and then I've got my job, and then I've got friendships, and then I gotta have some fun. And we start, like, we, we, we do all this, right? Like, we have, we, we have more than what we know how to do with our time. This is the human condition. And then they're like, oh, you know, get the iPhone, it will save you more time but you'll get addicted to it, so it won't, you know? Like, like everyone's trying to cheat the code. There's only one way to live into the fullness of time, and it's to be submitted to God's time, right? So, so here, here's what I found. If you'll give God his time first, right? This, this thing's full. You're like, that thing's full, right? Will this fit into this? No, you're like, that doesn't add up, right? But there's just something, there's secrets. Like, when you do the right things, the big things first, right? You just... You just, you're like, oh, I don't know if it's going to fit. I don't know how, if I'm going to have enough time if I pray that many hours in the morning. I don't know if I'm going to have time to have fun. I don't know if I have time to hang with my friends. I don't know if I have time to, to exercise. I don't know if I have time. But somehow, if you just be faithful to what God asks you to do with his time, it's like, it, you're like, I don't know if this is going to fit. No, it's going to fit. We're going to stay here and I'm going to do a Houdini act if it doesn't. But this is, this, this is going to fit. I already did this. I tried it this afternoon just to make sure. No, I'm, I'm serious. This is so real. I don't want you to forget this. You're like, I don't know how I'm going to do it all. I don't know how I'm going to be a dad. I don't know how I'm going to be a good pastor and a good preacher and still intimate with Jesus. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know how this was going to fit. But not only that, but I have room up top, right? Because when you do it in God's way, it's like, this is, this is obviously an illustration, but we think in mathematics and God's like, you can't add it all up. It's not going to work. You can't do it mathematics. God's, God multiplies. God impregnates time in a way. I, one of the, the things, Jackie and I do this every year. The end of the year, we go out to dinner. We go out to a nice dinner, and we literally look through all the pictures of the year, and we reflect on everything that took place in that year. And without fail, it's the same response. We look, we're like, how did this much happen? I'll tell you why. Because God sets our calendar. When I met Jackie, I think it was our second day, I said, hey, I just want to be real with you. She said, okay. And I said, usually when people come into my life, I said, the first six months will be crazy. More will happen in your relationship with God than like you know how to describe. I said, it'll be like the last six years. She thought I was being prideful, but I, was, I, I knew it was going to happen. And then she like, has an encounter with God and everything changes and just like the deep, all the stuff. And, she, like, and a few months later, she's like, I thought you were cocky. She's like, this was way more than I bargained for. And the reason I know that is because I don't live on my time. I live on God's time. I expect supernatural fruitfulness. I expect days of favor because one day of favor is better than a thousand days of labor. I expect it. I literally live into it. Literally, every, almost every month, week of our lives, we sit down. And I have moments when I get into the flesh and I go, 
Jackie, I don't know how we're going to do all this. I, like, seriously, my, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to be a lover and a worshiper of Jesus that invests the time that I want with him. I don't know how I'm going to be a present dad that gives the energy and the attention to, to, to be a present husband that my heart's alive to you and we're, 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 we're investing in our relationship, that I'm taking care of myself because you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself and I, you know, I spend time like exercising and eating right and doing all of this and, and still having some semblance of fun and play in my life and be a pastor and preach the word every week. And now God's calling us to itinerate and travel around and actually bring life to other communities. And there's growing international ministry and opportunities to go on international trips with a young family. And we literally look sometimes, we're like, I don't know how we're going to have the money for this. I don't know how we're going to have the time for this. And then somehow God's like, just don't worry about it. You just listen to me and know what time it is. And when you hear that bell, say yes. And, and it changes. Every, he sets my calendar different every month, every week. Do this, don't do this. But you gotta be alive to what time it is because God's timing is more important than time. And when God impregnates our time, things explode out of our time. Fruitfulness will come. And this is the thing. We will live under the flourishing of God's blessing. Every identity and assignment that he has given us to fulfill will be blessed and we will have margin if we are living in the easy yoke of Jesus because somehow... God fills our time with more than what we think we can fill our time. Now, does this mean it's always easy? No. Does it require sacrifice? Absolutely. It requires a cross. It always requires a cross. Now, I'm trying to be so practical tonight. Every time, now that we, you know, overseas, when Jackie sends me overseas, she sent me overseas for three weeks in January with a one and a half year old. We do that in faith that the cross will lead us to life. We looked at each other at the end of three weeks and said, I don't know how, but that worked. Because there was grace. Because where he calls us to, he gives us grace. He blesses our time. It's holy time. It's sanctified time. He impregnates. He overflows out of the time. For you, time, he doesn't matter because you're living in the way of the world. But for me, I live in Cairo's time. I live where his timing, his grace, his spirit is breaking in. My watch is set by the Holy Spirit. My calendar is filled with appointments by God. I am not living, I just want to say this, to live on God's time is going to require yeses and nos. I'm having to get much better at living with people being upset with me. Well, you said da 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 da. I'm living on God's time. Some of you are going to have to start scheduling your time with Jesus. And when your friends say da da da, you say, sorry, this is my time with Jesus. Like, right, like, where is the brow you and the priority in your life? Whew, okay. I, w- I, I want to do a couple things. We're just going to go into ministry. If you need to get your kids, you can get their kids. I, I first, I just, I had a couple things that I think are words of knowledge. Is there anybody in here, you're struggling with a respiratory disease that's manifesting in your breathing, like you're struggling breathing. I don't know if you're short of breath. Is that you? Is there anybody? Yeah, right here. Awesome. Is, if, is, did you raise your hand as well? Yeah, just keep your hands raised. Stan, I, I had a feeling it could be a couple. And if, if anybody's on the ministry team, if you can just go lay hands. Is there anybody else? Okay, yeah, I see a few hands. Yeah, I just had this sense in worship. So, um, you know, what, what, we're just going to pray a simple prayer. Um, again, we've been given authority by Jesus. And he says, faith comes by hearing um, the word of God. And so I believe that God wants to heal respiratory disease right now that there'd be released. So Lord, we just thank you. Um, These are your beloved sons and your beloved daughters and that you love them so much. And so we just speak your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, that the lungs will release. God, that this, the effects of whatever this respiratory illness is will be reversed and that there will be a life. God, there'll be breath there will be wind, God, if it's like asthma or, or whatever it is, God, if it's something that's, um, I feel like one of you, you, you're on some sort of a steroid medication um, that kind of, and I just, that, Lord, there, there would be a, a, a removal of the need to even take medication because of healing in these bodies in, in Jesus' name. And I also had a sense that there might be someone that you have an issue with your right ear that you've been believing for some sort of a breakthrough. I don't know if it's deafness or if it's pain or if it's a bleeding sound, but it's someone in their right ear. Is that anybody in your right ear? 
Awesome. Yeah, just, just put your hand on your right ear. And again, if there's prayer team or, or anybody, staff, whatever, just, just lay hands. I, 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 I don't know why, but I just sense that the Lord wanted to bring healing tonight as we're talking about um, the redeeming of time. So, um, yeah, thank you, Jesus. We just release healing uh, right now uh, in, in Jesus' name, God, to these people that are standing. Lord, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are living and active and that you impregnate our time um, with supernatural grace. So we just ask, God, that a miracle will take place tonight, Lord, that your kingdom come, your will be done in these bodies as it is in heaven. Um, I, 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 wanna, well, if, if, I want you to test it if we're praying, like test it. Um, test it and see if there's anything different. I know sometimes I've heard somebody, if you, like if you had asthma or something, test it. Like go for a run out in the parking lot. Do something that you couldn't do before um, and, and actually test it. Um, and then we'll give space to testify if anyone's healed in just a moment. But I want to I wanna create opportunity for anyone who's moved by the Spirit tonight that you're saying, I need to get off my time and get on to God's time. And I, I just had this picture of people like you, you, you're taking your watches or your calendars or your phones, whatever is your timekeeping device, whatever it is that's kind of, I don't know, maybe ruling your life in this way, and that you would, you would sanctify it before the Lord uh, and, and actually invite the Holy Spirit to, to fill your time. Um, and so if that's something that you wanna do, um, it's not necessarily an emotional thing. Uh, it's a prophetic act that's kind of opening up your life and saying, hey, you can come and have my time. And so if that's something you want to do, you know, the cross is open tonight. If you want to just lay your watches or your phones or your calendars or your schedules or whatever it is that represents that, if you don't just lay it at the foot of the cross, um, I, I just want to, you're welcome. You're welcome to come and just respond um, to the Holy Spirit uh, as he moves tonight. Um, I, I do have a sense, um, and, and you're, you're free to come. We're just going to kind of go free freestyle here is, I have a sense that there are some of you that you sense, you've, I feel regret in this room, that you're like, like I've lost time. Like I've made mistakes and um, like I've got time that I can't get back. But I just, I have a sense that the, the Lord wants to bring redemption to time tonight. And if you need, you need the Holy Spirit to redeem time. Um, and, and you're battling, I want you to just come forward right now because I have a sense that the Lord really wants to um, minister. If you're feeling a sense of guilt um, or, or, or condemnation or, or like this um, regret, you know, of what the locusts have stolen in my past, um, because you're saying, you know, I don't know, it's maybe because of mistakes or hard-heartedness or, or just selfishness that was blinding you. I just thank you, Jesus, that our Redeemer lives. I have a sense that there, there's, there's a number of people in here, it's specifically in the area of financial decision-making. You have such regret over um, financial decisions that you made in past seasons that you feel like you're still bearing the repercussions from. And I just have a sense tonight that the Lord is bringing redemption to your time. And I, and I just have a sense that the Lord wants to redeem inheritance. And I see the story of the prodigal son where the prodigal son comes, he has wasted his inheritance. He is covered in shame. And the father runs and puts a signet ring, which is a symbol of inheritance upon his son. And I just have a sense that there is a, a gifting of inheritance, a, a reclamation that it's almost like the father's like, you can't waste, you can't waste the depths of what's in my heart for you. Like the father is still generous. And I just thank you, Lord, for redeeming that you will break shame, that you will break regret. Lord, and we ask you to come and bring redemption tonight, Lord, that you will step in to um, the, these stories, God, at this exact moment, Lord, this, this uh, June 2nd evening, you will step into this time and you will bring redemption to their chronos, Lord, to their story, to their past, to their present, to their future. Lord, because you're just that good. And so I ask, Lord, for unexpected financial miracles, Lord, that will serve as signs of the redemption of God to those that are bearing this, this, uh, this regret. And so we just thank you, Holy Spirit. We just say, come. Come and redeem. 
Lord, by your power, by your spirit, come and redeem. And I'm just going to invite the team, the ministry team, if you would just come and, if you would just come and, I just feel there's something of a spirit of prophecy tonight that the Lord wants to speak prophetically um, to those that are responding. And so um, if the ministry team, if you just want to come and, and begin laying hands and let the, the, as the spirit gives unction to just speak prophetically over these, um, the, these, these situations, God, this, these, um, this, this, these confessions of the need for redemption. And we just say, Holy Spirit, overflow. Overflow right now. Just spill out. Spill out. Spill out. Lord, wake us up right now to what time it is. Some of you are waking up right now to what time it is. Just say, wake us up, Holy Spirit. Wake us up to to what time it is right now. Lord, we let go of complaining. We let go of bemoaning. Lord, and we wake up. We say, yes, God. We say, yes. Let us hear that bell ringing tonight. Lord, that, that freedom bell, God, of true freedom. True freedom. Freedom to follow you well. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. We just say, come Holy Spirit. Come and fill. Come and set our calendars. Come and fill us with divine appointments. You know, I have a sense that there's some of you, um, you, it's almost, you're like, I have grieved the Holy Spirit because of my hardness of heart and my unwillingness to obey him. And, and uh, it's almost like that, that the conviction of the Spirit's grown dull in your life. Um, but I, I have a sense it's waking up right now. That some of you, um, the unction of the Lord, He's coming and he's, he's, he's inviting you into obedience. And I have a sense that some of you, it's an obedience from a past season that you didn't fulfill. It's almost like He's giving you another chance. And, and we just say, Holy Spirit, we open. Come and convict. Come and prompt. Come and speak. Come and step into our stories and author beauty. Lord, author redemption. Lord, make us like Jesus. Make us like Jesus. Lord, I ask for the wisdom of God to come and bring us an awareness, Lord, of the beauty of the cross. Lord, open our eyes to how you are actively working to form Christ in us right now right now in every circumstance, in every situation, Lord. Open our eyes to the favor that has been placed upon us from Christ Jesus. that there's been someone or some people in car accidents that the enemy has stolen time and there's been a residual a residual effect from car accidents both money and pain and the Lord wants to come and redeem not only the health what was stolen in the finances but redeem the time that's been stolen so if you've been affected by a car accident that is still acting as a locust in your life the Lord is coming to redeem and there's going to be a ministry team up here if you want to come and receive ministry the Lord is coming to heal to set free to deliver and to redeem in every sense of the word so if that's you we invite you forward now in the name of Jesus we thank you God we thank you And 
the word over this house is there's going to be a season of acceleration, an acceleration of time. And we're agreeing right now that there's an acceleration of time that what would have taken years and decades, the Lord is bringing an acceleration now to, to bring it swiftly in the name of Jesus. And so we a partner, we agree with Lord that you are accelerating the time. You are turning the watches backwards, so to speak, and you're filling it with the fullness of time. And we just declare right now that there's breakthrough happening, that what would take decades and years, there's an acceleration of breakthrough right now that you are going before people and you are charging people. You are, you are, you are spiritually going before people and impregnating the time with purpose. And we declare an acceleration now in the name of Jesus, that your spirit would come and energize time like never before, Lord, that when we open up our calendars, God, there would be an acceleration of time, Lord, an acceleration of purpose, Lord, that you would come and redeem every minute in the name of Jesus. We declare delays are broken in the name of Jesus. Delays are broken in the name of Jesus. There's acceleration happening where there's been hindrances right now by the power of the Spirit of God.